This is an e-learning course brought to you by Contemplative Light. We are a community of spiritual teachers and writers, graciously offering our insight, experience, and most importantly, our love. We hope you enjoy your course. And so now we come to one of the more well-known mystics in the Course, St. Francis, whose life we have a much better understanding of, a much more thorough documentation of this late 12th, early 13th century Christian mystic. In our categories of mystic, the visionary, the lover, the unitive, and the iconoclast, St. Francis, maybe even more so than any other, fits squarely in this role of the lover. He is kind of transformed into uh, divine love, not as a, an abstract concept or one who has kind of removed themselves from, from society, like a Richard of St. Victor, who was more scholarly, more of a teacher, uh, more of a thinker. But we have St. Francis who communicates uh, the divine love to others, specifically those in need, the poor. Francis was uh, the son of a wealthy merchant of Assisi, and early in life, something of a kind of a, a, a common youth, something of a, a womanizer, a carouser, partier, but then was engaged in a battle. And this, this border dispute was taken prisoner and spent a year in, in a cell. There came down with some kind of sickness and also he had time on his hands while a prisoner to reflect on the meaning of life. As he's sick, he's also reflecting on the frailty of the human body going from a kind of privileged life of uh, a wealthy merchant's son to this experience uh, of kind of kind of humbling uh, experience of the prisoner he, it seems that some seed was planted during that experience that cultivated the capacity for deep compassion with the poor the needy the downtrodden as he reflected on the meaning of life uh, after his release, which was negotiated, he was kind of in a daze, in a, a spiritual malaise, in depressed, we might call it today. He came up disappointed thinking about the meaning of life after this sort of harrowing, transformational experience. Started to think of himself as, as worthless and was really in a very aimless place. While sort of wandering the countryside, he comes upon this, this chapel or, or, or church in San Damiano, famously. He, he hears uh, the voice of God. He feels he has this divine, transcendent experience. Here's the voice of God speak to him saying, Francis, don't you see my house is being destroyed? Go then and rebuild it for me. Funny enough, he, he, he took it very literally, so he, this is kind of a ruined church, so he goes to get some stones and, and physically try to sort of replace some of the missing pieces of this church in San Damiano. Uh, but anyway, he has this sort of strong inner conversion experience and, and dedicates his life to service and prayer, though his, his kind of transformation into the spiritual leader we think of today is not yet complete. He goes on a pilgrimage to Rome. He sits with the beggars in Rome. He, uh, he, that's who he kind of identifies with when, when he's in uh, the, the heart of, of, uh, of the church. Dedicates his life to serving lepers, specifically. These lepers who are excluded from medieval community life that are, are in their own a colony that are considered the unclean, cannot be touched, and uh, Francis goes to them of his own accord, spends time with them, ministers to them, certainly sort of upsets the apple cart in doing so. So he has a mystical vision of Christ telling him to rebuild his church, and he hears this voice about the, the church in San Damiano. 
He goes and sells some of his father's cloth to take that money and to give it to the, the priest of San Damiano to help rebuild the church. And the priest refuses it, so he sort of throws it on the floor. This leads his father to kind of go after him, punish him, beat him. He, he's about the money. He wants his son to follow in his footsteps. And already he's kind of a disappointment in his aimlessness, in his depression, in his uh, failure to contribute to the family cause. And he looks like he might be a lost cause. And here he is not only being this kind of disappointment, but actively costing the family money. There, His father brings him before the, the, the town fathers and kind of this public display as a kind of final point of, of punishment and instead it kind of has the opposite effect and St. Francis ends up breaking relations from his father. Francis has heard a sermon about leaving everything behind to follow Christ and took it as a personal call again a little literal and he leaves behind all of his belongings he undresses, throws aside all the clothes. The legend sort of walks off into the forest by the town. He ends up with, with a dark garment and a simple cord, what we now think of as the, the Franciscan habit. Takes it as his, like a, a divine order to have no second tunic, no money, no sandals, no walking stick. So that's why these, these Franciscans are often thought of as the discalced or the shoeless, the barefoot. That, such is their commitment to going without possessions to poverty. Uh, and in their day, certainly with the rise of, of wealth, uh, uh, shoes were, and the, the kind of shoes that you had and the embroidery on them would be a kind of sign of, of wealth and, and a status. So to, this is a kind of symbol socially that, that where they're not going to engage in that kind of game altogether. They're, they're living out a higher calling. So Francis draws up a simple rule and founds the Franciscan order to follow the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ and to walk in his footsteps. These became the Friars Minor and were known as a mendicant order uh, rather than a monastic order, dedicated to service rather than solitude. And there you get the, um, the understanding, the distinction between the more cloistered, monastic contemplative that uh, you know, lives in solitude and uh, community with other monastics. Instead, the Franciscans were out and about. They were amongst the people there primarily to serve the people. They, may, they might beg for alms to be able to go about their ministry and swore off property as a means of preserving the purity and the kind of uh, moral virtue necessary for their spiritual work. And so after weeks of fasting and, and contemplation of Christ's sufferings and, and after a, a night of prayer, Francis has a vision of a crucified seraph with six outspread wings. And at that point, Francis receives the stigmata, those physical manifestations of the wounds of Christ on the, on the, the palms in his own body. And there are several sources that attest to this, and, and this seems to be something that's a little rarer, certainly in the Protestant tradition, but throughout the Catholic uh, church history, there have been several instances where this seems to be a sign of some kind of unique, special connection of an individual with the sufferings of Christ, and oftentimes in preparation for them living out a um, life of, of love, humility, and service to others in the footsteps of Christ. One uh, key piece of writing that we have from St. Francis is this canticle to Brother Son. He was a man, you know, in harmony with the cosmos, considered the elements, the natural world, like brothers and sisters. And the Franciscans, this order under Francis, contributed to the, the Christmas nativity. This is a preliterate time, by and large, and for the kind of lower classes to grasp something and have some sense of, of the Christmas story, Again, Mass at this time, probably mostly in Latin, not the vernacular local language. The Franciscans had this, this practical contribution of the nativity scene, 
the, so that the, the local townspeople could kind of participate and, and get immersed in the Christmas story. They also contributed uh, the Stations of the Cross. So even today, if you go to monasteries, and oftentimes at a parish or, or church, there are the, these, these Stations of the Cross that allow a participation in, in these different kind of scriptural moments of the walk up Calvary toward the cross, and that celebrates the humanity of Christ to the layman. So much of the um, medieval church life would have been to manifest the sacred nature of Christ. The Eucharist was said to be transubstantiated, and you were in these ornate places oh, worshiping God, and you might feel a sense of that gap, that distance between the human and the divine. And the Franciscans kind of brought that closer together in, in this way that the local believer could kind of participate in an embodied experience and kind of a, a, a feel a connection to the humanity of Christ rather than what would have been emphasized theologically. So much of Francis's teaching was in that vein, much more practical than intellectual. Most of the writing we have on him is written about him in his life versus his own writing, which is sparse but powerful, like the canticle to Brother Son. He, he preached and he served and he prayed and had a sense of God's all-pervasive, all-pervading presence and saw all people as children of God. And you really get this sense from these stories of St. Francis of the, the kind of divinity of his love and wisdom and humility uh, and generosity of service. He wanted to know the uncreated father of all things through all of creation, especially the humanity of God's son, Christ. And, and he saw all creatures in praise of God and that as humans, we are we participate in that process of praise and are stewards of that creation to help facilitate that. Major works, if we can call them that, his canticle to Brother Son is well known. He has this piece of writing called Make Me an Instrument of Thy Peace, which is well known, a prayer. What we know about him is broadly taken from St. Bonaventure's Legenda Major, a collection or sayings and writings and prayers attributed to Francis was um, put together called The Little Flowers of St. Francis. One of the stories in, in The Little Flowers of St. Francis attributes Saint, uh, to St. Francis the um, saying to his followers, they're, they're, pat, they're, they're on, the, on their way somewhere together, and he says, Wait for me while I go preach to my sisters the bird. Intrigued by his voice, the birds stayed, and not one of them flew away. And so you get this famous image of St. Francis sort of immersed in nature, whether sometimes it can be portrayed as a deer or the birds that are alighting on him, that he is somehow in alignment with, in accord with, and immersed within nature. And so some quotes of, of St. Francis. The Lord was poor as he lay in the crib, poor as he lived in the world, and who remained naked on the cross. That gives some sense of, of St. Francis's emphasis on Christ, not just his humanity, but specifically his poverty as he moved through the world. And that was the quality that he tried to emulate in his life and then his followers' lives. And he seems to have this center of gravity that draws others to him, and they live out this creed and, and or practice rather of providing service and love to others. And then the canticle to Brother Son, Most High, all powerful, all good Lord, all praise is yours, all glory, all honor, and all blessings. To you alone, Most High, do they belong, and no mortal lips are worthy to pronounce your name. Praised be you, my Lord, with all your creatures, especially Sir Brother Son, who is the day through whom you give us light, and he is beautiful and radiant with great splendor. Of you, Most High, he bears the likeness. Praised be you, my Lord, 
through sister moon and the stars. In the heavens you have made them bright, precious and fair. Praised be you, my Lord, through brothers, wind and air, and fair and stormy, all weather's moods, by which you cherish all that you have made. Praised be you, my Lord, through sister water, so useful, humble, precious, and pure. Praised be you, my Lord, through brother fire, through whom you light the night, and he is beautiful and playful and robust and strong. Praised be you, my Lord, through our sister, Mother Earth, who sustains and governs us, producing varied fruits with colored flowers and herbs. Praised be you, my Lord, through those who grant pardon for love of you and bear sickness and trial. Blessed are those who endure in peace. By you, Most High, they will be crowned. Praise you, my Lord, through sister death, from whom no one living can escape. Woe to those who die in mortal sin. Blessed are they she finds doing your will. No second death can do them harm. Praise and bless my Lord and give him thanks and serve him with great humility. And so that canticle sort of famously encapsulates these qualities we identify in the life and work and service of St. Francis of Assisi. In his attention to nature, attention to the created order, in its en en enacting of praise, in its invitation to praise, in its emphasis on the relationality, the interrelatedness of the created being and the human, that which sustains us, sun, moon, the elements, uh, uh, wind, air, fire, and yet this kind of repeated invitation to humility in the midst of the created order. And also this arc, this life cycle, he invokes not just this beauty of flourishing life, but also sister death, and includes that in, in the kind of this holistic appreciation of what we go through as humans, not just existing with the created order, but this looking forward to death. But uh, there's a, a light touch with all of it. He, he in, invokes death as inescapable, but also as a sister as interrelated with all the other natural processes. Uh, woe to those who die in mortal sin, though, is the one kind of caveat or warning he gives. And a couple stories from the Franciscans that sort of illustrate the kind of person that St. Francis uh, or Francis of Assisi was, and that give a sense of him being committed and attuned to the divine to the exclusion of his social standing and acceptance, that he was a kind of holy fool. One of the, the first pieces of biographical information we get about him is from another Franciscan brother who knew him well. And he writes, Then he entered into the city of Assisi and began, as though drunk with the Holy Spirit, to praise God aloud in the streets and squares. And this description of of St. Francis as though drunk with the Holy Spirit, like a drunkard would going about praising without a care of how he is perceived by others is so much, uh, you know, so revelatory, reveals so much about the kind of, of person he was in his social context without regard for his, uh, how others perceived him. Here's another piece. It was in the days when Francis was still wearing his secular clothing, even though he had begun to renounce the things of the world. He had been going around Assisi looking mortified and unkempt, wearing his penance in his appearance, in such a way that people thought he had become a fool. He was mocked and laughed at and pelted with stones and mud by those who knew him and those who did not. But Francis endured these things with patience and joy as if he did not hear the taunts at all and had no means of responding to them. So this we can kind of think of as that separation process from society as entering into this 
separate sphere in accepting rejection humbly and graciously, even though he still had his regular clothing on. He, he became a foolish figure um, from the outside looking in and had to put up with people throwing stones and mud at him because he was rejecting their way of life, but doing so exuberantly, joyfully. You know, as we so often do, we need a scapegoat who we want to kind of shame into conformity. Francis was a figure that, that couldn't be bent, whose will could not be uh, bent back to uh, conformity to the society of, of his time. Another story that illustrates the, his commitment to his way of life and to poverty was when he was daydreaming amongst a group of friends and they w called him out and one of them said, so Francis, what woman is it you're thinking about that you're daydreaming about over here? And he says, you are right. I was thinking about taking a wife more noble, wealthier, more beautiful than you've ever seen. And they laughed at him because um, this was not of his own accord, but because he was inspired by God. In fact, the bride was the true religion that he later embraced, a bride more noble, richer, and more beautiful because of her poverty. And this is becomes personified later in the, in the Divine Comedy, a sort of lady pot poverty that is uh, a, a, the, the symbol of the divine virtue of poverty that, that keeps this, this moral purity, this kind of innocent retort from St. Francis further kind of underscores the kind of person he was, how, you know, how he related to the society of his day. And some key takeaways for Francis of Assisi. One is that connection that he maintains between spirituality and poverty. During this era, we see his father is a merchant. In previous eras, previous uh, centuries, if you were not part of the landed class and nobility, you did not have access to wealth. But we see here in, in this um, 12th and, and 13th century, this uh, 13th century even more so, this, this consolidation of wealth in kind of urban centers and the rise of this sort of merchant class. And in response, people like, like St. Francis are having this kind of... Uh, countercultural removal and disassociation from the corrupting effects of wealth and the, the, the more widespread consumerism and kind of status symbols and everything that goes with the accumulation of wealth in, in these urban centers. There is a kind of reactionary quality in some of these monastic movements like the Franciscans who were, were seeing these changes take place but wanted to maintain the purity of, of the spiritual pursuit and spiritual life and embraced in the Franciscans in a very profound way the life of poverty. They espoused a, a, a simple kind of faith and a, a passionate devotion following the example of St. Francis who, who exhibited this love of nature and love of others in service, specifically dedicating himself to the the poor and the outcast, specifically the, the leper population. And he also had this kind of central love of the Eucharist as a means of, of connecting with the divine and being infused with the divine life. And I think centrally what comes through, Francis is almost the archetype for, is a quality, yes, of compassion, but throughout his ministry of learning wisdom, compassion, love, service, is his humility. And all other aspects of his life and ministry can kind of be tied back to adopting a posture of humility toward others, creation, and toward God. This concludes our course. To learn more, please visit our website at www.contemplativelight.com We look forward to seeing you again soon.